Okay, so uh, we're going to start this panel by asking each one of you guys, uh, what is the reason you would do a keto diet? What is the main reason you're, you're running a low carbohydrate or ke uh, ketogenic diet? So let's, uh, let's go ladies first. I uh, came to the weight loss stage for the mood stability. <laughs> I used to have uh, type 2 bipolar disorder, and I've been off meds for almost 10 years. So um, most people start keto as a tool for uh, losing weight. In my case, I actually started keto to gain weight. Uh, this is something that uh, wasn't very open until a few years ago. I was anorexic and I started keto because I found that it helped me in a way um, control cravings and so it helped, helped me gain the good type of weight. Um, I actually don't do a ketogenic diet. I do more metabolic flexibility, but if I was kiteboarding and got dropped on my head and had a TBI or traumatic brain injury or some type of pathology, then I would be definitely ketogenic. I actually even carry a ketogenic ester in my kiteboarding kit just in case. They didn't do me in my kids. They were smart and would talk a lot. So um, I'm, the good news is I'm losing my voice, so um, you won't have to listen to me the whole time. Um, Then I have a couple of pre-written questions and we're gonna go for to uh, open mic. What is the difference between a ketogenic diet and an ancestral diet? Can they uh, coexist? Are they completely different? Because uh, the meme is that, oh, I'm doing paleo, oh, you're just eating bacon and fat. Is that is that true? Can they coexist? What's the difference between them? Uh, I think the ketogenic diet can be done in a completely non-ancestral way, and probably uh, it would be very hard to replicate an ancestral diet completely <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I do also think that an ancestral diet would be ketogenic, if not uh, necessarily all the time, a lot of the time. And so I think they, they overlap in some way. I uh, agree very much with Amber. I think that depending on exactly where the population lived, they would be either in some uh, seasons ketogenic or in a degree of ketosis, or of course they lived uh, more closer to the equator, of course uh, they would not be ketogenic all the time or even, uh, even ketogenic at all. Yeah, I agree, it depends on which population you're looking at. Are you talking about an Eskimo or a Southern? They're gonna be different. Uh, for ketogenic, I like the definition of nutritional ketosis, which is probably 0.5 millimolars of ketone BHB. So if you're using that as your cutoff of at least an entry point, then you can try a bunch of different approaches to see where you end up. Um, I think that a lot of the things you're hearing on the panel is just context, 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 right? I mean, it, it, it's, I think that there is a, a substantial overlap between diets of our ancestors and a more sane or a context-driven approach to a ketogenic diet, right? We were chatting up here before they handed us mics about uh, the idea that, you know, carbs aren't necessarily the devil. They may be in certain cases with, you know, specific conditions, but if you're an ultra marathon runner, if you're a high level jujitsu person and you're not taking in some amount of carbohydrate that would kind of blow the traditional ketogenic model, you're going to blow it. Your score will stop. I mean, like there's just very, very little data. And even the people that sort of run keto, a lot of them will actually train low and, and compete high. So not higher carbohydrate form. Go for it. I, I really like uh, Mike's point about what, what ketosis actually is, and if you're going to think about it from the point of, say, 0.5 millimoles, then um, 
that's very different from what someone might think automatically when they think about a ketogenic diet that's being used ther therapeutically where you might want to be in the two millimolar range. And so sometimes when people are arguing, is a ketogenic diet ancestral or were such and such a group ketogenic, they're arguing past each other because one of them's thinking they're, uh, to be ketogenic, you have to be at this very huge level of ketosis and it has to be all the time. And so um, thinking about that quantitatively does clear up a lot of things. Speaking of ketosis and, and quant uh, quantifying that, is it necessary to quantify ketones for, let's say, weight loss? Uh, I think that, that ketones themselves can be a real red herring for weight loss. Um, yes, it can show that you're burning fat. It doesn't say where that fat's coming from. <laughs> um, also, uh, just being in the state of ketosis can sometimes be sufficient to reach a, a lot of um, goals, health goals, including weight loss, but then having more uh, ketones doesn't necessarily mean that your goals are being reached more efficiently. Um, if, if you follow the, the fallacious reasoning to its endpoint, you would think that adding more uh, ketones from the outside or adding more fat might cause you to lose weight, and maybe it does in certain contexts, but not necessarily. Yeah, um, for fat loss specifically, I tend to say uh, chase results, not ketones, because people get fixated in the number of ketones they have, and they start either using exogenous ketones or adding fat, and they forget that if they're already getting results, they don't just need to eat uh, more fat or more ketones. Ketones are, as you know, a byproduct of fat mod uh, modulization or metabolization, and like Amber said, it really depends on where those ketones come from or where they are generated, either the belly fat or the dietary fat. Yeah, I agree, and we have to keep in mind what we're actually looking at. So that's just a marker of the blood levels of ketones. That doesn't really tell us anything about what's coming in or what's going out. It'd be like filling your bathtub and just looking at the level of water in there. It doesn't tell you how much water is coming in or how big a drain there is on the tub. It just tells you the level. And because I think some people get stuck in oh, my ketones aren't high enough, so I need like, you know, four more tablespoons of butter to lose weight to get my ketones up, and it's just kind of a downward spiral from there. That started way down the spiral, and then it got progressively worse. I agree, and we see it all the time. I mean, when we kind of live in a ketogenic community, in our community across all spectrums of about a quarter of a million people, we just see it repeatedly. People say, well, I eat the way that you recommend, but my ketones are only 0.3. A great an analogy that once uh, someone said to me is like trying to determine the speed of your car by looking at the gas gauge. So yeah, yeah. so you're looking at energy levels and trying to determine if uh, having more ketones uh, means that you're losing more fat. It's not it's just available energy. You know, we got into the trouble with vitamin D when we figure out how to test vitamin D levels, and then we can just apply some vitamin D. You can see there's like vitamin D floating in the bloodstream, but is it really activating the receptors? Or you know, when you convert sunlight into vitamin D, you're you're having different pathways activated. But you know, if you have low vitamin D levels.
animals uh, ingesting a little bit of vitamin D can be beneficial for certain autoimmune conditions. Is there any benefit to exogenous ketones? Uh, Mike, you talked about TBI. Um, is there any benefit to having exogenous ketones in your bloodstreams? I would say the data on that is still preliminary, but my bias, if I get whacked in the head, um, what happens then is you're gonna have a massive energy crisis, right? Glucose metabolism gets all screwed up. You're gonna have a high amount of inflammatory mechanisms, things of that nature. And I always look at what's the potential upside, what's the potential downside. If I can do a ketogenic diet, we've got pretty good data to show that there's probably not a bunch of huge downsides. There's a few other issues we can talk about later. The upside, I would say, probably hasn't been entirely clearly defined, but for me personally, I'll take that risk because I'm mitigating the downside and I'm not really sure of the potential upside. So ketones there can possibly have a direct anti-inflammatory effect and they also serve to pinch it as another fuel source uh, while your brain is going through that process of trying to heal. I want to tack onto that really quickly. One of the interesting things about ketone salts and ketone esters is it's kind of a novel place in human and evolutionary physiology because ketones are a byproduct of either a starvation or of human starvation or of, and I know Amber, you're going to disagree with my conclusions here, and that's okay, but they are functionally the fuel of the absence of carbohydrate. But we see a lot of people using exogenous ketones who are not depriving themselves of carbohydrate, and so it is a very weirdly novel environment that you're introducing that doesn't exist in the history of human physiology throughout all of ancestry. We, at least not that we have any markers or indicators of or anything in the genome that would indicate that to be the case. And so it's, it's an interesting place to stop and think about for just a second to say, is it harmful? Probably not in small doses, but when people are desperate and they're trying to lose weight or remiss symptoms of a condition, and they're doing this thing where they've decided their doctor doesn't know what they're talking about and therefore they're gonna go do it on their own, and somebody tells them that they cured Ebola with exogenous ketones, they'll buy it and they'll do it. And literally, I, I, I spoke with a woman at a conference, it was actually a book from USA two years ago. She was spending $1,500 a month on exogenous ketones. There's a real downside to these things for people or in general. Or a business opportunity. <laughs> True. Um, but you know, that, that, that's, and I'm belaboring the point, I apologize, but it's just, an, it, it's a, I think that there are applications, right? You know, neurodegeneration, oncologic care for certain cancers. Yeah, sure, run those ketones as high as you can. But again, it circles back to the fallacy that more is better and it's just completely lacking in evidence. So I'm actually gonna agree with you 100%. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't think that, that, that we do have a precedent for high ketones with high glucose, well, except for diabetes, right? And that's not a state we really want to replicate necessarily. <laughs> um, but to your, <laughs> to your other point, uh, that there may be certain situations where you want to get the ketones high as quickly as possible, like in the traumatic brain injury. If you didn't happen to be ketogenic that day and you had that accident, maybe you want to do that really quickly. Or if you have someone who is a patient and isn't compliant, or if you have someone whose insulin is up for other reasons that don't have anything to do with uh, normal physiology and it's preventing their ketones from going up high, that could be an issue. But we don't know exactly which of the benefits of a ketogenic diet are coming directly from the ketones. We know, we can know some of them because there are some studies where ketones are given and we can see there are anti-inflammatory effects, for example. But when you change the context, all those pathways are up the chain of change, so it's, it's an unknown. You brought up a really interesting point when you, when, when, uh, you mentioned like Annie, but there are the, the effects of ketones, but we need to also appreciate that BHP in high doses actually shows a down-regulation of hormone-sensitive lipase in the adipocytes. So if we're trying to lose fat, I mean, again, shifting away from the therapeutic context and accepting type 2 or whatever, there is actually a potential detriment to running ketones extremely high um, because it is going to down-regulate the, the lipolysis. So, uh, this is a controversial topic, uh, but let's talk about macros. What, what would be the optimal macronutrient composition for a diet that would be applicable to most people? Not just specific populations, but like, let's say you want to try keto, a ketogenic 
diet, where would you set that protein intake? Is it, you know, do we want to restrict pro uh, protein intake to prevent um, protein proteinogenesis? Uh, do we want to keep protein high to prevent muscle loss? Where, what, are, what would be your recommendations for protein intake? So you, you phrased it in a way that is, I'm really glad. You said, what would be a good starting point? Um, and I think that the best starting point, the easiest starting point, unless, like we were talking about earlier, there's an immediate therapeutic need to get really high ketones, um, then I think you should start ad libitum, actually. Um, cut out the carbohydrates to some <coughs> low level, and then eat fat and protein to what's desired and see where that gets you. And then only if that's not getting you the results that you need, then you might start playing with um, higher fat or higher protein. And you know, it's funny, uh, you said it was controversial and, and I agree that it, <laughs> that it can be, I don't know if it is among this panel, but um, uh, some people think that if you, in particular for weight loss, that if you want to lose more weight, you have to, uh, you should be cutting the fat down and raising the protein up. And other people, uh, are saying that it, you need to cut the protein down and raise the fat. And I think there are really good arguments on both sides. And we're not really sure why one would be better for one person and why the other would be better for another. Um, so I think a, a lot of personal experimentation is warranted. OK, so for starters, uh, I, I would say it really depends on the context. And even though you said that a general application uh, I wouldn't really do that, you know, my general recommendation. Because for, for us, especially in people who we work with, if we see that the person is over 40, I would, and of course, depending if the person wants to actually review macros and count, I would give a specific recommendation. If the person just wants to start the diet, I would go very much like what Amber said, just eat basically meats and some side veggies, if you like vegetables, and pretty much eat uh, ad lib. That's my usual recommendation. If the person actually wants to uh, you know, lose weight and actually wants to count macros, I'd rather have a focus on uh, whole foods that include both protein and fat. And basically just use the fat that comes along with the protein. And if we get people that are over 40, I would put a little more emphasis on protein because uh, I'm very uh, pro-protein in the sense that I prefer people to avoid sarcopenia at any cost. And I see people, especially uh, women, that are afraid of eating protein. And so when they start a ketogenic diet, they end up uh, on 35, 40 grams of protein a day because of the fear of you know, uh, getting bulkier or uh, not losing weight because of the protein. And then, yeah, they may lose weight at the start, but at the expense of also losing lean mass. And then they solve, and that's how you actually downregulate your uh, basal metabolic uh, rate because you're losing uh, uh, muscle mass, right? Yeah, I agree with that the context matters. I mean, there's a study looking at protein synthetic response in younger people, age 20 versus average age of 71. They used whey protein as a supplement. The younger people got a pretty good response from 20 grams. The older people needed 40 grams. So they needed twice the amount to get the same uh, acute response. Uh, but if you're looking at a therapeutic thing where you're really trying to get someone into a high state of ketosis for whatever reason, um, I agree kind of with what they said. Look at their diet, see where they're at, probably cut back on carbohydrates. Most of the time in my experience, if I'm doing that, you probably need to get below 50 at a minimum to start out and see where you're at. From there, then you're just balancing to see, do I want to scale back protein a little bit? What are the pros and cons of that? Or maybe you don't want to add a little bit more fat. Um, but yeah, I have concerns about having a very, very low protein intake, especially in an older population. No, I, I, I would completely echo the sentiment here. There is there is just much less data of harm from overeating protein than there is from harm of undereating protein. Um, and we can have a complete sidebar in the hallway about plant versus animal proteins and all that fun conversation, but setting aside all of that and just saying when in doubt, generally a little bit more is not going to hurt you within the context or the framework of having like a proper amount of calories relative to what you're trying to accomplish, whether that's weight loss, whether it's therapeutic and you don't need to concern yourself necessarily with that, whether it's like cachexic losses or sarcopenia or whatever. Do we have any questions, Jody? So our 
our first question is, um, for a keto diet, would you recommend that for digestive issues, IBS, um, different, different um, digestive struggles? I personally would recommend a plant-free diet for digestive issues. Um, often the biggest problem with digestion is too much fiber and or um, susceptibility to plant toxins because of increased intestinal permeability that make plants that otherwise might be very healthy or benign become a difficulty in digestion and uh, autoimmune diseases. I can actually answer this because I'm a practitioner and I see people with IBS. So uh, it depends. Uh, yes, intestinal permeability, big problem. What I've seen a lot of times is that people are not trying to get to the root cause of what's ca causing the IBS. It could be, you know, uh, an infection, parasites. It could be uh, toxic load. It could be an autoimmune response to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, whatever you're eating. So investigating what the root cause of the problem is and maybe use a, you know, uh, very small diet or a restricted diet where you're eliminating uh, carbohydrates. You know, a, a ketogenic diet tends to be a little bit more hypoallergenic and uh, working with that frame, um, that can be very, very beneficial for IBS. The problem that I do see at my practice is that sometimes when you start doing really uh, small, narrow diets, you feel a little bit better and you keep narrowing down and narrowing down and then you end up with orthorexia. So if you have a very narrow diet, trying to investigate what the root cause of the problem and then reintroduce stuff in order to have, uh, you know, a, social lifestyle and, and so you can enjoy your life, that would be uh, very beneficial. But yeah, starting with a ketogenic diet, it's a very good starting point because it tends to be very hypoallergenic. Uh, I would send them to Guillermo or <laughs> someone who's a practitioner. Uh, but in general, it's probably some type of elimination type diet. And I agree with this point that the question I always tell clients to go back and ask their doc is, how long do I run this? How long do I feel good? Whatever markers you're using, and then how do you expand it back out on the other side? Because I see a lot of people just do an elimination type diet. They felt amazing, and now they're convinced that they have to only eat four foods the rest of their entire life. I have like, I mean, there is data out there that clearly shows that eating a ketogenic diet definitely affects gut microbiota. In it is ostensibly. is the, it, can you get the benefits without ketosis um, to avoid the problems of the microbiome deficiencies, down-regulating pathways? So what would be, I guess, coming out, of, coming out of ketosis? How would you do that effectively? Or can you do that effectively? I would say if the question is how do you transition out of a ketogenic type approach I do work with a fair amount of those people. And the short version is if you're doing a ketogenic diet, you're going to have some changes at the muscle level in relation to insulin. So just giving them a boatload of carbohydrates usually isn't going to go very well. I find that just slowly working up their carbohydrate amount works good. If I had a choice, I would give that probably post-exercise. seems to be tolerated a little bit better. And then just slowly kind of working that up, see how they feel. You get fancy and measure, you know, blood glucose and things like that, but what I usually find is people just get too hyper-aggressive, and they go, ah, screw ketosis, I don't want to do that anymore, ah, I don't eat all the carbs I can find. Oh, I feel horrible now, what happened? Like, eh, you probably went a little bit too hard, too fast, and your body wasn't prepared to handle it. Yeah, in, uh, in, in our case, what we do very much is that approach. And uh, it's not like uh, we tell a client, okay, you can have uh, 40, 50 extra grams of carbs and then go and have a donut or something. No, it's like, 
Okay, we transition from keto to a semi-paleo approach, and then the carbs you're gonna have, like you said, probably post-exercise, good healthy type of carbs, some fruit here, uh, some vegetables there, uh, potato, etc. And then it takes probably, in our case, uh, I'd say uh, four to six months to have someone from probably 20 grams of carbs to about 120, 150 without any stomach or any issues whatsoever. So there is clear physiologic insulin resistance that happens in a chronic ketogenic state, but there's also upregulation of fat, uh, you know, there's fat that indicates fat directly into cell tissue. So, you know, from that perspective, yeah, you have to kind of play with uh, a slowly moving scale because we don't know since fat can sound like crazy and then they call it an ego psychopath. And we've all done it. I mean, we've all gone on those adventures at some point where it's like, okay, I can't really eat you. Perpendicular. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, you have a, a nibble of cake that turns into a slice that turns into an entire cake. And maybe that's just me. Um, it does not end well at all. Um, this one is oh, about concerns about. Uh, uh, sorry, I just wanted to add something. Um, when I first started a ketogenic diet uh, 20, more than 20 years ago, uh, I was very influenced by Lyle McDonald, who uh, he talked about doing a cyclic ketogenic diet, which a lot of bodybuilders did. And so there was a period in my life where I was on a, on a very low carb diet throughout the week, and every Friday night I would go to the bar and have fries and beer. And it, it, it was fine for me. I don't know if that would address the person's question about whether that would fix problems with the microbiome, but I'm not sure I, that I know that we know that the ketogenic diet gives problems to the microbiome, but, but it's not always the case that, uh, I think some people can really tolerate rapid switches back and forth, and that can maybe address concerns about uh, chronic ketosis. And you could do a ketogenic diet with keto brownies and keto pizza, and then, <laughs> and then go and have beer and chicken wings. Or you could do at, you know, vegetables and, and, and meat, and then uh, do cycle in carbohydrates, you can eat with two birds and you know, so you can do it the smart way. Yeah. This one is about the uh, concerns about the ketogenic diet. Um, and I'll just list off like two things here that overlap a few questions. Any worry about mTOR stimulation in cancer no. or problems, <laughs> problems with cardio with cardiovascular disease or cancer? And then also another person asked about microbiome deficiencies and downward feeling in I want to add to that nutritional deficiencies by excluding of groups of foods. Any, any opinions on there's that? A, there's a way to eat like a, I don't even know if I'm going to use a square word here. Um, you can eat poorly in any dietary strategy that you want to. How many vegans do we know who eat Hostess cupcakes and, you know, they, they run through and they get their fruit drink every morning? And, then they, and I don't mean to be disparaging, but like, then I know vegans who are very intentional about the way that they approach diet. And, micronutrient composition and all of that. The same thing happens in the paleo space and in the keto space. And you know, I don't care where you look, you're gonna find an easy, lazy way to eat that really only addresses calories for calories sake. And on the mTOR thing, that is such a complicated cascade that this idea that mTOR stimulation equals cancer is just, it's dead on arrival to people that really look at the clinical stuff. Does that mean that we should constantly stay in a state where we're stimulating the, that pathway or no. But that's kind of the point. We should be eating in a punctuated fashion. The fact that we have a lot of metabolic dysregulation probably has to do with the fact that we eat too much and we eat too frequently. You know, we're eating almost all the time. We eat a meal, then we take the snack with us to the desk or the office, and then while we're eating that, then we look and it's lunchtime and we go to eat. And so we're constantly stimulating that cascade of metabolism, and that in and of itself is problematic, but it ain't because of lean fat that I think to be honest, I think the CD narrative is a little bit played out with respect to fat causing cardiovascular disease also. Because have you heard of isotopic eating like crap or is your intellect eat much more than one meal? I want to add about mTOR. mTOR is a signal, it, it takes in a signal of getting fed. And so there's really no way to constantly keep mTOR down without not eating. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to eat something and, and I agree with Tyler that, that the best way to approach that is to, to separate the signals. So you, you stimulate it, and then you stop stimulating it. 
And one advantage that I think a, a ketogenic diet has in that respect is that you can go uh, much quicker from a state of uh, fully fed and stimulating mTOR, even with a, with a huge stage of you know, as much as possible with protein. And then uh, the amount of time it takes to get back into that uh, autophagy phase where mTOR is being inhibited has got to be, I don't think we have exact times in any study, but it's got to be quicker than the two or three days of fasting that it would take from a high carb diet. And so I like to think that um, if you're on a ketogenic diet, you're probably in a state of optimal autophagy overnight compared to somebody who's on a high carb diet and has to wait for three days of fasting and do that in a targeted way over and over in order to get those benefits. I, I just would like to compl uh, complete Amber that people are now really into fasting because of autophagy and there are various ways to uh, generate autophagy. Certain types of foods, strength training, uh, exercise of course, uh, but also ketogenic diet. So if you're doing a ketogenic diet five percent, you're in periods of autophagy and then of course you're in a fat state, you're going to turn a little bit mTOR up but then you're gonna turn it up, so it's down. So it's like a switch. It's uh, yin and yang. You have periods of growth and uh, creation, and then you have periods of uh, sanitation in a way. Well, I think I would add is if your overall dietary approach is more restrictive, whether that's a keto, vegan, whatever, there's, like you said, there's definitely ways you can do it and do it well. You just have to be aware that it's gonna take you a lot more effort, and it's gonna be a lot more conscious to do that. Uh, the less restrictions you have in general, you have the opportunity to eat more variety and probably miss a lot of those micronutrient deficiencies. So it doesn't necessarily mean that one is going to be worse than the other. You just, if you're going to be a vegan and do it in a very healthy way, you can do that. But there's a lot of other things you have to pay attention to because you're taking an approach that is more restrictive to start with. I, I tend to, um, when people ask me this question, I just uh, give them a certain Type of types of ex examples. Uh, for example, people tend to say, well, you cannot restrict a whole micronutrient. And if you actually do a well uh, ketogenic, uh, a well prepared ketogenic diet, most people, I'm not saying a lot, end up eating more vegetables than they were eating before. Like at 20 or 30 or 50 grams of carbohydrates, that's a lot of food volume coming from vegetables. And people tend to say, oh, but vitamin C. Well, instead of having an orange, just look at, for example, a, uh, a broccoli, it has more uh, vitamin C when compared to 100 grams of uh, orange juice. Or potassium, and they show you a banana. Well, just look at red meat and uh, look at uh, avocado, for example, and so on and so forth. I haven't found yet a single nutrient that you cannot get on a well-formulated ketogenic diet in similar or even better quantities. Is there any reason to worry about long-term keto? I've been so far almost 20 years in keto, and I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I, I will just say that when I say this, people tell me, huh, you've been on ketosis for 21 years, like you've never had a pizza, or like it doesn't, it's not like that, it's like I may go out of ketosis for, I don't know, five, six, seven times a year when I feel like if I have a, want to have a slice of pizza, I want, I want carb or whatever, something that I do very sporadically, so I'm not really completely in ketosis all the time. Pretty much like people who are not in ketosis may go into ketosis overnight because they've been fasting for 12 or whatever hours. Nothing happens, people that go just by chance into ketosis don't die. So the same happens to people that have been doing keto for a while. Only thing I would add is that you, like if you do any new dietary approach, you probably want to talk to your physician, have a basic blood panel at least run, do whatever intervention you're gonna do and have another blood panel run at that point. I have seen very rare circumstances, some just wonky numbers from people that have done a ketogenic diet. It's definitely not the norm. It's definitely, I'd say, more the exception. Most of the other data we have, you know, look at the Charlie Foundation, things like that. We don't see a lot of long-term issues. But anytime you're doing a different intervention, you'd wanna make sure you know what your own data is, just in case there is something that's odd about your specific physiology. So,
don't want to put you on the spot, but in response to like using blood markers as an indication, there may be some complications with that that we haven't really thought through. Uh, thank you. Yes, 